naming something, you know, giving something a name is always quite difficult because the name has to convey a bit about what it's about, but at the same time, it can't tell you everything. Otherwise, the titles would be extremely long. So <coughs> I had to decide what I thought the story was about. And it seems to me the story is about... It, it is about dragons in the sense that dragons were mythical creatures that represent, well, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But everybody has dragons. We all have dragons of our own. I bet if you sit and think, I bet you think, well... There's a side of me I really, really feel at ease with, and there's a side of me that's more difficult to deal with. And the side of you that's more difficult to deal with might be your dragon. Like, <laughs> when I was your age, and when I was at school, I was a very, very difficult pupil. Um, because I, I'm not quite sure why, but I didn't like to be told to do anything. So if I was left to my own devices, I was quite a good student. But if somebody said, we'd like you to learn this poem... I could think of a thousand reasons why I would want to learn every other poem <laughs> except that one. And, um, and I would fight for that position. And part of that was good because I think it's quite good for each individual to trust their own sense of themselves. But on the other hand, taken to an extreme, that's not a very good thing either because that meant I was missing out very often on a very important thing, which was I never asked the question... Well, why this particular poem, which is a very good question, I would just say, no, I'm going to learn that one. So I would say my dragon was to be overly individual, and that's not a very good thing. So what's the story of Hosmaria about? Well, it could be about many things, but for me it was about one very, very important thing, which is human frailty. You know, there's not much difference between human beings when we come to think about it. I mean, we sort of think there is... And I bet you think that you're very different to your friends and your friends are very different to each other. And it's true, we're all individuals. But I bet we're all worried about the same kinds of things. We're worried about, are we doing well? Do people like us? Are we going to fall in love? Will we get married? <laughs> Will we be good at business? What do we do if people say they don't like us? Um, are we good? Are we bad? Whatever that means. So we, we actually all have the same problems. And... We live in a rather interesting time, I think, in which we're generally told that human beings are basically just chemicals, that we're just evolved chemicals, really, and that there's nothing special about us, that we are sort of improved apes. Um, well, there's some truth in that, because evolution, which is a rather beautiful process when you look at it, teaches us that we have a lot in common with... with um, um, chimpanzees who are our closest, if you like, mammal um, sharers of, of DNA. But there's a trouble with this, which is it forgets one very important thing, and I think it's the most important thing for all of us, and that's the idea of free will. Up to maybe five years ago, neurologists would have said to you that you are only your brains. They would have said, if something goes wrong with your brain, something goes wrong with you. So in actual fact, you are just chemicals. So that means... In this room, sitting here, there's just lots and lots of chemicals, <laughs> all of whom are kidding ourselves that we're not. That's sort of where science has led us. Bad science. Actually, that's not true. There is a difference between mind and brain. The fact is, the mind appears to live in the brain, but they're not the same things. And... To an extent, you are your minds in the same way that you are your body. You, you, you are your brains in the same way that your bodies. But more importantly than that, you are your minds. And therefore, we're not just advanced apes. We are something very, very extraordinary. Because mind means we can choose what we do. Now, the choices may not be easy because our bodies and our brains may encourage us to go in a certain way. But in actual fact, we have the ability to change the shape of our brains. Do you know that? That by thinking, you can change the actual structure, the neuronal structure of your brains. And this is fairly new research, but it's not that new, and it's not so new that I don't know about it, and I'm not a doctor or a neurologist or a scientist. So that, for me, is very, very important, because that means there's something very, very remarkable about everybody sitting in this room which is everybody sitting in this room is capable not only of exercising free will, but actually changing 
the very way in which your brains are put together inside. Well, what's doing the changing? And there, science comes to a very interesting full stop, because it doesn't know. It doesn't even know what consciousness is. You're all aware that I'm here sitting talking to you, and I'm aware that I'm here sitting talking to you, and I'm aware of some of the things you might be feeling by reading expressions on your faces. But <laughs> what it is, none of us know. And that brings us to the point at which human beings begin to try to decide, because they may decide that's divine. They may decide it's something other. We don't know. Different religions take very different views about that. <coughs> so, if we accept this, it would be interesting to me, it was interesting to me, to tell a story about what I think is the most difficult thing for human beings to do. And the two most difficult things for human beings to do are quite difficult, really, are quite surprising, because we don't think they're the most difficult. The first one is love. This is a funny thing, but it's a lot easier to hate than it is to love. Well, that's awful, but it's true. I mean, think of the people you hate. Oh, my God! I really hate them. <laughs> And when you love people, you tend to say, well, I really love him, but he just does so-and-so. Or I love her, but she does so-and-so. a but creeps in. That's curious, isn't it? Because love, actually, is the most fertile, the most rewarding, and the most rich of human experiences. The second thing that's really, really difficult is to forgive. I mean, really, really, really forgive. I'm not sure I'm very good at doing it. But some people are. Some people are. I remember watching an extraordinary program on CNN. And um, a woman was being interviewed, and she was a Rwandan woman. And the CNN interviewer, who was a sort of blonde, I thought rather ditzy woman, <laughs> um, in the way that CNN can be, with her microphone, said, I'm sitting here having tea with Mrs. X, and Mrs. X is very extraordinary, and the camera's on Mrs. X, so because she's having tea with Mr. Y, and the camera goes to a young man sitting there, and she says, and this man killed her entire family. But they're having tea together. And then she turns back to the woman, and, and in feeling a bit like I would have felt at that time, she says, but how can you do this? How can you sit and have tea with a man who in front of your eyes killed your husband and your four children? And this woman who was not educated, <clears throat> or at least I should rephrase that, hadn't had the advantage of as good an education I'm sure you have here, she said, my children are dead. Therefore I must honour the memory of my children. And why would I let him win by passing on a legacy of hatred. I want my children to be remembered in a legacy of love because I don't want this to happen again. Well, that's strength of character, isn't it? I mean, that's... I looked at this woman and, you know, the tears came to my eyes because this was so truthful, what she felt, so strong, you know, and so much what I think it is to be a human being that I was overawed. And then I began to look for these things and I found a Palestinian father who set up um, a, a, f a trust to work with Israelis because his daughter was killed by an Israeli tank. And he said the same thing. I owe respect to my, to my child's memory to forgive and to produce good things for the future. That's marvellous. And that, in an essence, is what the story is about. Now, I've used very, very powerful examples. But if you think in your own life, we are all in need of forgiveness. I certainly am. I can think of lots of people who I hope forgive me. I always get the feeling that if I ever do go to heaven, if there is such a place, and I kind of knock on the door, you know, a little, it's a be an English heaven, of course, and, <laughs> and the door will open, and a little voice will say, yes, who's that? And I'll say, you know, it's Roland Joffe. Say, oh, I don't, your name's not on the list. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got you, Joffe, Joffe, yes. Hmm. Well, come in. And then I'd hear a lot of voices say, inside, say, oh, no, did I hear you say Roland Joffe? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I said, Brenda, oh no, he, if, if he's coming here, I'm going. <laughs> That's it, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. I can't like him to be eaten. So I know that there are a lot of people who need to forgive me, and, and if I really tell the truth, a lot of people, well, not that many really, that I should forgive, and it's not very easy. And here's the truth it's not very easy because it takes work. And here's an even more important truth you know what? Nothing good is easy. It all takes work. I don't know why it should be like that, but that's the way it is. 
We have to work on ourselves. But here's the amazing thing. If we do the work, we change our minds. Literally change our minds. So all those Buddhists who for many years have been meditating have now proved to scientists that in meditation they change the organisation of the neurons in their brains. Our brains are plastic. That means we can literally change who we are by work. And I don't mean work in like a grim, horrible kind of way. <laughs> I mean determination. I mean going with your hearts. Going with what you know fundamentally to be a good thing. Because here's the funny thing about human beings. We all fundamentally do know what's a good thing. Years ago I was asked to do a film about President Marcos, who was a dictator in the Philippines. And I was asked to do it by the wife of his opponent, who was called Aquino. And she told me the story about the two of them, and a very interesting thing crept into my mind, and I don't know how many of you know Macbeth, the play of Shakespeare's, but this applies to that play. (coughs) Aquino was essentially an extremely good man, and part of his goodness was in, if you like, opposition to the not-so-goodness of um, President Marcos. President Marcos could frequently have had Aquino killed, but he never did. In fact, when Aquino was ill with a heart attack, Marcos sent him to America to have an operation, although he was officially his enemy. Now, that's very interesting, and I'll tell you why I think that was. You see, I think that Marcos knew that fundamentally what he was doing was wrong, but that Marcos wanted to be good, and that in some strange way, if he kept the little flame of Aquino alive, there was always the possibility for him that he was going to do something good and he was only temporarily bad. (laughs) And this is a very weird thing, but if you push anyone who's not psychotic and insane, but any normal human being, and some psychotics, I suppose, you will find that they believe they're only temporarily bad. I'm going to be good soon. It's just discipline that kind of makes them unable to break the habit. So that brings me back again to this idea that I want to tell a story about dragons, and I started describing some dragons to you. They don't have wings and tails. Well, but they do when they're inside you, don't they? Because they're pretty powerful. So that's what's in the name. Sorry, that's not a long answer, but it's a very good question. Next. So I wanted to know how the researching for the film and also directing the film, how it affected you personally if it did. Well, wow. your question is very good. <laughs> not I watched the film. Uh, oh, I'm glad I must have told well. Um, okay, well, the research I, I did by meeting people, because, well, I'm reading, of course, but reading is, reading is a very good thing to do because... It, it gives you a broad spectrum of information. So it's very important. It's also a bad thing to do because it's weirdly disconnected. I mean, I read, you, know, you read something in a book that says, and he walked into the room and he said X and Y, but you don't know what the feeling was. And, of course, human beings are feeling. So part of, of my research was to talk to people. And the first question I had to deal with was, what did I feel about God? Um, and that sounds very grandiose, but since I was dealing with a man who was a saint... I thought I'd better ask myself that question honestly. And when I asked the question honestly, I was, I was a bit embarrassed, actually, because I didn't really have a very good answer. I mean, the answer I had sort of was, well, you know, I can't prove that he isn't there, and if he or she or it is, maybe I should believe in him, because if I get to heaven and was too lazy to believe, maybe he'd be a little... <laughs> wouldn't like that too much, but that's not a very good reason for believing, really. And then I thought... Well, I was kind of trained and brought up in a world where God was sort of irrelevant, uh, and in fact, God was rather boring, and apparently was some old white dude sitting on a throne who you know, <laughs> sort of handed out merit marks. Uh, and that's why I didn't like religion when I thought about it. And then I thought, and also religion, you know, and I come to think about it, religion is responsible for so many wars, religion is responsible for so much hatred, and, relig- and I began to realise that I had all these arguments in my head, but I hadn't really thought about them. I'd sort of absorbed them with Coca-Cola and tea and (laughs) accepting that banks are good and all that other stuff that we just believe. And I realised that I hadn't been thinking, that I was in my... Well, I won't tell you my age, but I was was (laughs) 
relatively advanced, <laughs> and, and I hadn't been thinking. And that was a bit of a shock. I thought, my God, I spent all these years thinking that I'd been thinking, and I haven't, which I hadn't. So I thought, okay, well, the discipline will be, my views about God don't actually matter. I mean, they matter to me, but they shouldn't matter to anybody else. But Jose Maria's views about God, they really do matter. Because he believed that there was a God. He believed that he communicated with the God, and God communicated with him. And he believed that human beings could dedicate their life in a very profound and beautiful way to this essence that he believed in. So I thought, okay, if you're honest, you must accept when you write that that is the truth. In other words, I had to lay aside Roland Joffe, the relaxed, cool dude who doesn't believe in God, and replace him with somebody who says, that's of no interest. What's of interest is what did Hosmaria believe and what did Hosmaria do? And that led to another thing that I thought was very, very important, which I discovered when I got to Opus Dei, was that there isn't really such a thing as Opus Dei in the way that there's such a thing as sort of um, a political party. Because a political party very often tells you what to think. In fact, many political parties will go further than telling you. They'll shoot you if you believe something different. <laughs> At which point, of course, you wonder about what is actually going on here. Although frequently we don't think. But the key to Hosmaria's view of, of life as I understood it was to say, no, look, you are a child of the God that I believe in, who I believe is a God of absolute love. You also have free will. Therefore, my job is not to tell you what to think, neither can it be Opus Dei's job. My job is to raise one issue for you, or two issues. The first one is to say, why not make everything you do part of a giant and beautiful vision, which is I do everything beautiful out of love. But what kind of love? Well, love for your family is a wonderful thing, but why don't we take love for your family, love for your wife, love for your friends, and make that an even grander enterprise and say, but my friends, my family, the people that I love, they are, in essence, part of something that was given to me as a great gift. But given to me by whom? Well, given to me by life, which in Hosmaria's Maria's terms is given to me by God. And therefore, why don't I say, everything I dedicate, I'll dedicate to this greater entity. Well, why is that important, guys? I'll tell you why I think it's important. It's because... If we accept that human beings are complicated and we all make mistakes, isn't it rather a good idea to say, when I get really angry with my wife, my husband, my friend, that I temper that anger by saying, but we're part of something grander. Not saying, there are only human beings and nothing else, therefore I really hate that person, therefore I'm going to cut them out of my will, shoot them, never speak to them. <laughs> all those things we say when we're angry, which hopefully we don't do. And I began to think that there's something very beautiful about this idea, this idea that we should have something outside us, grander than we are. That doesn't mean that we are nothing, which is what modern science tries to teach us. It just means there's something beautiful in the story that says that we are fragile. We'll make mistakes, you know. Now, when I was young, I never thought I would make mistakes. I don't know how many of you think you make mistakes. <laughs> it's only now when I look back and I see the string of them, you know, like a great necklace of mistakes. And I, just wonder, <laughs> I have to drag this around with me now and admit that that was me that did these things. But that was the kind of research I started to do. And that research began to make me feel, well, in a weird way, better about being a human being. And it made me begin to feel, well, this is really why I should be making the film. The film should be about this. And it should be about something else, which is very, very important. I realised that Hosmeria also said, God is found in the everyday. Well, first of all, I thought, oh yeah, right, so you find God in a bakery, that's cool. <laughs> God's in a plant, God's in a building, and God's in my Vodafone. <laughs> and then I realised I was being stupid again, which I frequently can be. <laughs> that wasn't what Hosmeria was saying. He was saying something far, far different. He was saying, God is potential. See, I think what he was saying is, God is a great, loving question mark. And what's the question that God poses all the time? As Maria would put it, the question is, what are you going to do next? 
And then I realised what Jose Maria was really saying. And this is what it is, I think. And correct me if I'm wrong, I frequently am, but this is what I think it is. I think he was saying, we are all materialised energy, and science will tell us that. We're all made up of particles. The same particles in this table, incidentally, as are in you. You're made up of stardust. <laughs> there are particles in your body that are not found on the Earth. They actually come from the stars. In all those years ago when the Big Bang put all this energy in the world, there's neither more nor less energy since that day. So we're all sharing in the Big Bang. We are all, in that sense, part of the most intimate and extraordinary moment of creation. So religion's got that right. Not wrong, just the way the language that expresses it is different. But what does that mean? Well, it means this. If we are materialised energy, the fact that we are materialised is important, and that brings me to the story of Christ. What does the story of Christ mean? It means energy, God, the most primal energy we could think of, became human. Well, that's remarkable. Because then we are all Christ. Because we've all become human, we've all taken the same journey. So when we say Christ is in us and we are Christ, oh my God, what a wonderful thought. <laughs> because actually, scientifically, and I happen to be weirdly involved with science, there appears to be a lot of sense to that. But what might that mean? Well, that means every question that is posed to you is, comes in material form. In other words, God doesn't sit there and say, uh, Hey, Rowan, come here, Rowan. What do you think about love? Or, Rowan, come here. What do you actually think about death? What do you think about life? No, it happens in a very different way. Somebody I know dies. I have to deal with that. And I can't deal with it by writing a treatise about it. I mean, I could if I was a novelist. But even if I was, I have to live my answer. Which is what? Which is to get angry, to get depressed, to understand that that means that life is fragile and this person lived a life and that I am fragile and that everybody I love is fragile and therefore, my gosh, if people are going to die I need to love them more, not less. Those questions can only be answered practically by living your answer. Just like the woman I described who lives forgiveness. But my God, look at the way the lesson for her arrived. The lesson did not arrive as a textbook saying what you think about forgiveness. The lesson arrived in life was a man walked through the door with a submachine gun and shot her four children and her husband. That's a practical question, guys. It's practical. And life is only practical questions. Illness, success, um, fear. All those things are things that you live. But they are all questions because each one of those things says to you, how will you deal with this? And what Hosmaria is saying is, if you make love your all-enshrining view of what life is, you will answer those questions with love and strength. And not like me, with a sort of slightly devious sense of humour. <laughs> which is okay. Or like some other people who get angry. Because when you look at it, what are the choices? You know, the choices to answer these questions are quite small. There are not that many of them, and it's basically... Do I answer with love? Do I answer with anger? Or do I answer with something in between, which is like, comes out as a joke because I don't really know? So you're all going to be asked the same question. So the privilege you all have, because you suddenly popped into being, I mean, before you were here, you weren't here. So you couldn't answer any questions in a material way. Maybe you were here immaterially, we none of us know. But the fact is, you are here. Whoa, that's a privilege. It's a stunning privilege, guys. You have all your futures ahead of you. You are going to be the most amazing people. Why? Because you're going to be answered these questions. You'll be asked these questions and you're going to have to find the answers. And you have the strength to find the answers and the strength to help other people find the answers. That's what I learned from the film. And that was the research that I did. And that's kind of what I wanted to tell. And that's why it's a film about forgiveness. Because it's a film about a man who made many, many mistakes... In fact, his life was a bead of mistakes. Who at the end of his life realises a fundamental truth. I need love. And realises that all his life he needed love. In fact, everything he was doing was because he didn't have love. Counterpointed by someone like Jose Maria, whose life is filled with love, and everything he does is passionately concerned with love. So concerned 
and so much did he dedicate his life to something other that he doesn't really have an intimate personal relationship and that's a rather saintly thing and then I realised that there is no such thing as a saint there are only saintly acts and people we decide are saints happen to have a string of saintly acts on their necklace but that doesn't mean that you are not capable of doing saintly things and that's what Jose Maria was saying because if a saintly act is like a little bead you know, a little pearl that you can string on a necklace most people you know somewhere in their lives will have a couple of beads on the string and that's so cool <laughs> and that's what Jose Maria is saying in less racy language than me but I think that's what he meant